Hi guys, it's time for another quick update on my DIY sailboat refit. For anyone new to this channel, the lovely looking sailboat here behind me is Athena, and soonish I hope to be traveling the world aboard her. I've already made a video explaining how I plan on transitioning into being a full time cruiser, and that's linked in up here. But before that can happen, there are lots of projects to take care of. Not the least of which is a DIY osmosis treatment. As you can see, I've taken the hull down to bare fiberglass. Also, as a part of that, treatment I'm tracking the moisture levels inside of the laminate. So let's grab a fresh set of measurements and take a closer look. I enter all of the measurements into a little spreadsheet, so that's 45. I've grabbed all the measurements, but I think this meter might be quite heavily influenced by the temperature of the laminate, because according to the measurements I've just grabbed, the hull has dried out as much in the past week as it did in the last eight weeks. So <laughs> I don't think that's right. If it is, it's amazing, but I don't think it's right. So I think we'll grab some measurements a little later today when the hull has had a chance to warm up. It is about 10 or 15 degrees colder this morning than the last time I grabbed some measurements. So yeah, we'll get back to the moisture levels in the hull a little later on in this video. For now, let's head up and take a look down below. It is a super gorgeous morning and today would be an awesome day for a sail, but at the same time, there are lots of projects to take care of here aboard Athena. To quote a very popular TV show, winter is coming and soon it'll be too cold to, for instance, paint the inside of the hull. Of course, I plan on heating the boat this winter using my reflex stove, but stuff like painting the inside of the hull and the bilge, well, I'll have to get that done within the next three to four weeks. In that time frame, it would also be awesome if I could install the reflex stove because it's about to get chilly here in Denmark. But before I can put up the reflex stove, I need to finish the galley. Two things have changed here in the saloon since the last video. The first is that I've filled the gap that used to be here. That is awesome news because that means I can start building the piece that goes here, which is a big part of finishing the galley which of course I'll need to do to be able to install the reflex stove. The second thing that has changed is the fact that I've started varnishing some trim pieces as you might be able to see here behind me. In a couple of weeks, my new port lights should show up. Once they do, I'll pop out the old port lights, paint the areas up there, and then pop in the new port lights. That should give me a nice clean edge between the port lights and the painted areas. Before I do that, I want to finish varnishing the trim pieces because that should also give me a nice clean edge between the varnished trim pieces and the painted areas. But we'll get back to the varnish just a little later on in this video. For now, let's get busy building the piece of the galley that goes here. Like I mentioned earlier this week, I filled the gap that was here. I did that using some 4mm plywood that I adhered in place with like an epoxy. I then wrapped some scrap pieces of plywood and plastic and used that to secure the patch in place. Then the next day I just came in and fed the surface of the patch just like I did with the patches on the bulkheads. I've knocked together this just to help me support the pieces of plywood that'll go here. And that's these two pieces here. Now I've already glued this up a few weeks ago and I've purposely cut this just a little bit too big so that I could trim it after I put the patch in place. So hopefully all I need to do is trim this piece and then I can go ahead and glue everything up. It won't look like it on video, but getting this to fit took an obscene amount of time. Nothing about this boat is straight or even remotely flat, but at least I think I've got something here that I can work with. It's very important to me that this edge here and this is parallel, otherwise the countertop is gonna look kind of odd. But yeah, it's just about perfect. If you use your imagination and pretend that the countertop is there, well, this is what the galley is going to look like. I think it's gonna look pretty cool. You know what? Just hang on a minute. Ta -da! Now it's not flush trimmed yet. This is just a rough fit, but this is what the galley is going to look like. And here it is with the reflex stove. Not too shabby. I better hurry up and get the countertop off of here before it's accidentally epoxied onto the rest of the galley. I'll hold off on doing the final trim of the countertop until everything is secured in place. That should make it a little less likely that I'll mess up. Hopefully I'll be able to show you that next weekend and also with a little bit of luck next weekend I should be able to show you the sink. But we'll get back to the sink a little later on in this video. For now, let's move on to something else. I'm very excited about what's in this box. LEDs, 
lots and lots of LEDs and also a light fixture. You guys saw me hook up this light a few weeks ago and I've been testing it since then. Whenever I dim the light there is some flickering. Now it's not as bad as it is on camera to the naked eye but there is some flickering and it's very annoying. The reason I chose this light to start with was because of its shallow depth here. I could mount this without modifying the headliner. This is 12 mm thick plywood and this is what the headliner is secured to. Now the headliner covers up all of this stuff and it's basically just a piece of plywood with some fake leather glued onto it. That is then screwed onto this. For me to be able to fit the new light I'll have to add about 5 mm to this. There is one huge upside to this light and that's the fact that you can replace the bulb. You can't do that in the other light I showed you. I think that's worth more than 5 mm of headroom. Mind you, I still have plenty of standing headroom, but that's why I've decided to order this. I'm hoping one of these LED lights will fit inside of this light fixture here and produce a good quality light without any kind of flickering. I have no idea if these LEDs are dimmable with a pulse width modulating dimmer or if that's always going to cause that annoying flickering you saw just a little earlier. But it says right here on the packaging that these are dimmable with the majority of dimmers. So, <laughs> yeah, that tells me absolutely nothing. But I'll find out. And while I'm at it, I'll uh, compare the light from the LEDs to this. The light from a good old-fashioned halogen bulb. That should give me a good indication of color temperature. But all of that is going to be its own separate video. I don't want to bury that content deep within this video. So, stay tuned. Now that it's a little later in the day and the hull has had a chance to warm up, let me just go ahead and check those moisture readings from earlier today, because I have a really hard time believing those were accurate. Sadly, the measurements I've grabbed just now seem to be a lot more realistic than the ones from this morning. I'm looking at them here in my tiny spreadsheet and temperature does seem to play quite a large role. All the measurements from this morning are between 5 and 10 units on the comparative scale lower than the measurements I've just grabbed now. So that's something I need to keep in mind. The good news is that the moisture levels are continuing to drop week by week. They're not dropping super fast, but they are dropping. Without further ado, here are the current measurements as well as their change over the last 8 weeks. This is potentially gonna be slightly annoying news. I noticed some areas on the hull with very high moisture readings and uh, I've just gone ahead and used a sharpie to trace an outline of those areas onto the hull and I think I recognize the shape. Those look to me for all the world not like the stringers but like the ribs. The reason that is potentially annoying news is because of the way the Warrior 38 is constructed. For me to be able to inspect that area of the hull, I'll need to remove part of the cabin sole. That is no small job. If it turns out that the uh, ribs are rotten and I need to replace them, well that is a whole nother can of worms. But for today I just think I'm gonna forget about it and uh, yeah, hopefully next weekend I'll have some kind of an update. So if you've got any kind of advice or a suggestion, go ahead and leave it as a comment down below. I almost forgot to mention that as a small experiment I've washed the aft part of the hull four times during the last three weeks and I haven't washed the forward part. I've done that to test the premise that there are hydrophilic compounds trapped within the laminate that needs to be washed out in order for the hull to dry. So far I have yet to see any kind of a difference but uh, I'll keep the experiment going and we'll see what happens. Now let's change topic to something much more cheerful. Varnish. I've got about three coats on there now and it's starting to look reasonable but I think I still need about two coats more to get the finish I want. Over the years lots of people have tried to convince me that applying varnish is difficult and that it's hard to get a good finish and that's simply not true. It does require a structured approach and a bit of patience. I'm pretty sure a lot of you guys have already applied more varnish than I'll ever get the chance to so I'm not gonna sit here and pretend like I'm some big expert but there are four things that I've learned so far that I'd like to share with you. The first thing I've learned is that controlling the thickness of the coat you're applying is crucial. If you apply too little varnish you'll get dry spots and if you apply too much you'll get runs. Of course that's much more pronounced on a surface that isn't horizontally flat. The second thing is when it comes to choice of brush I'm no snob. A not too soft brush that doesn't leave its bristles in the varnish is all I need. Synthetic or natural, well, it doesn't seem to matter much to me. The third thing is that it's really easy to take care of and clean your brush, so don't be afraid to spend a little bit more money and get a good quality brush that won't leave its bristles behind on your freshly varnished surface, because that is really annoying. 
When you're done varnishing, just use a bit of mineral spirits to clean the brush and store the brush in paraffin until you need it the next time, just remember to clean it before using it. The fourth and final thing I've learned is that sanding in between coats is crucial. I always just use some 320 grit sandpaper and this is the wet kind, this is just readily available around here and that's why I'm using this. Sanding in between coats is great because for one you get to remove any kind of mistakes that you've made, be it a bristle that's got stuck in the varnish or maybe a run, but you also get to smooth out the surface so that you get a nice smooth finish. A completely smooth finish like on the sample I made earlier this summer. This is what I'm going for. As you can see I've got a bit of sanding to do so I better get busy. Perhaps the fifth thing on my list should have been remember to bring some music. Wow, that was so much fun! I'd be hard pressed to find something you could do in a little over an hour that would be as much fun as that. Well, maybe not, but at least it's all gonna be worth it in the end. The next step is to apply the next coat of varnish. While one of these lights goes a long way towards making you look like a complete moron, I've found that they're pretty useful when applying varnish. I think that is about it for this coat. The reason I like wearing this lamp is because the light is so diffused from the port lights it's difficult for me to, to see the trim pieces. But uh, I think I'll have to end this video about Obelix because Jökul is about due for his walk and well, that's only me to take care of him. Before ending this video I've got a question for the great hive mind and by the great hive mind I'm of course referring to you guys. About three or four weeks ago I got a comment suggesting that I should look into the forced air heaters made by a Finnish company called Sapphire. So I did that and I gotta say I'm very intrigued. First off they don't have that 2000 hour limit on their warranty as all of the other manufacturers of forced air heaters. Their heaters are supposed to be 100% user serviceable and their distributor claims that they are suited for continuous operation. Like I've mentioned, I'd like to have a forced air heater aboard Athena to help keep the boat warm while sailing. I plan on cruising mostly the high latitudes, so having multiple sources of heat is certainly going to be a good thing. And that brings me to my question to you guys. Do any of you have experience with the forced air heaters from Sapphire? If you do, then please go ahead and share your opinion down in the comments. There was a bunch of other stuff I wanted to get into in this video but I'm just gonna cut the video here because well my back has been acting up for the past week and that's super annoying because the last six or five or six months or so have actually been really good. In fact they've been the best since the accident way back in 2012. So yeah well I guess you get some ups and then some downs. Yeah. Okay guys that is gonna be it for this video. See you! Jukul and I hope you've enjoyed this video. For more videos like it, click subscribe. Please consider leaving a comment and a thumbs up. It really helps me a lot and I appreciate your support very much. If you're new to the channel, please check out the introduction playlist. If you want to watch every single video I've ever published, check out the playlist named All Videos. It contains every single video listed in chronological order.